my crewmate actually was the first one to start this experiment. And I took over for him and said, hey, what, what experiment is this? What are we doing? And he looks at me and he said, well, I'm not sure. So we called down um, to the ground for mission control. And I know that part of this is we're looking at a, a gel that can release the antibiotics and kind of a slow release to a wound site. Um, but I don't know what happened to that plate in the nanorack feeder this morning and then kind of what's going on there. Um, what we're looking for is how the drug migrates through the gel over time, which is why we're scanning the plates two times a day for this two-week run. I like that answer. That's very cool. Thank you for finding that out. No problem. So this is 15 days, uh, twice a day, and they're typically in the middle of the night, which is the morning for, for the crew on space station, and then usually sometime in the in the late morning, early afternoon here. But Kyle's been running the show. He's been getting up every six hours, eight hours, seven hours to do this. It's kind of fun in a way. You, I get to play astronaut on the ground, so that's always fun. After 15 days of running the experiment, the researchers have a lot of valuable data about how hydrogels behave in microgravity. To learn even more, the samples will come back to Earth for further analysis. For the last leg of their journey, the samples will return to Earth in the same Dragon capsule that gave them a ride to microgravity. After Dragon splashes down in the Pacific Ocean, it's taken to the port of Long Beach, where NASA will be ready to retrieve the precious cargo. Splashdown for Dragon was on uh, Sunday, I believe. And so NASA has a group called Cold Stowage and uh, Cargo Manifest, and they go out and pick up the payload from Dragon. And then they distribute it to people at LA or uh, wh whoever needs them there, and then they bring them also here to the Johnson Space Center. Um, and so now I'm in, out front at the Cold Stow office, and I just picked up uh, Module 74, which is our chimp antigen project. And they hand it to me, and I put it in my cooler, and then I drive it over to uh, our office where it's going to sit until we fly up to uh, the chimp antigen office in uh, Richmond, Virginia, to uh, do the final phase of the experiment, uh, which is removing the samples out of the, the reactor microplate. We're really proud to take part in this really, uh, really interesting experiment. When we first got our gels back, it was already exciting because space never loses its cool, and so we had this place like, oh my god, these are what the astronauts touch. And so we opened them, and they've been to space and back, and now they're in our lab. Whenever a NASA aircraft leaves the ground, an entire team of people ensure that it executes its mission safely and successfully. The pilot and mission controller sit at the ends of a complex stream of data, along which dozens of IT specialists, engineers, and technicians work to ensure that each in-flight decision is informed by accurate information, and that all test or science data is successfully gathered and processed. At the Armstrong Flight Research Center, this team makes up the Mission Information and Test Systems Directorate, known simply as Code M, a critical behind-the-scenes force that helps Armstrong keep its reputation as one of the world's finest flight research centers. In most cases, new flight projects first approach the Mission Integration Office, or MIO. The MIO is
is responsible for the development of partnerships with key researchers, mission directorates, and external stakeholders. They help create value for our partners by providing an initial interface and a cross-functional integration of processes, capabilities, and operations. Lights of new aircraft or systems are first simulated to ensure that any novel concepts are working as designed, or to conduct trade studies, or to iterate a design towards optimum performance. Later, when an actual flight is scheduled, before the aircraft even revs its engines, simulation familiarizes the pilot and mission control team with the procedures and test points, and prepares them for unexpected situations. Engineers and technicians in Code ME the simulation engineering branch of Code M create one-of-a-kind simulation programs and hardware subsystem interfaces that enable NASA's pilots and their industry partners to understand how a new aircraft or system will handle or discover the most efficient ways to hit their data points. Ready to send checks. Sending check command now. Send arm. Arming now. Ready to send terminate. And terminating now. And we have a good arm term cycle. Well before the research flight phase, the range engineering branch, Code MC, engineers and software developers build, integrate, and verify range assets. This is how they ensure the aircraft telemetry can be received and processed for control room display monitoring. Aircraft position can be tracked for situational awareness. All right, this is a uh, EDN data two. I'm gonna go ahead and check everybody for their uh, control room display status now that we can both make checks up. Heard you loud and clear. And that control room voice communications are working. For unmanned aircraft, Code MC verifies uplinks for command and control and flight termination systems. We're gonna arm and terminate. We're high. Got him. And break the lease. If you have to use it by about five degrees, don't know. Tracking the aircraft while it's in flight is the responsibility of MR, the Range Operations Branch. From working with the U.S. Air Force, which controls Edwards Airspace, to scheduling flights, to keeping radar dishes locked on a supersonic airplane, to tracking that airplane with long-range optics, Code MR is responsible for getting the data from the airplane to the ground. This branch operates the telemetry tracking systems, space positioning systems, audio communication systems, video systems, mission control center, and mobile systems. After a flight, the data arrives at the Information Services Branch, or Code MI, which provides information technology solutions for NASA's workforce, everything from desktops to internet connections. Code MI also manages Armstrong's data center and network infrastructure, ensuring the right data is available to the appropriate users, from routine email to specialized mission-specific flight data. Finally, MI provides multimedia services, from graphic artists, photographers, and videographers, to web and repro. 
these skilled individuals ensure effective communication of the many activities and accomplishments of the center. These services include airborne photography and videography, specialty services driven by the demands of flight research. The multimedia products help make this information accessible to engineers, researchers, partners, and stakeholders around the center, around the agency, and out in the public. an important role. The Mission Information and Test Systems Directorate helps separate the real from the imagined through flight. There's this big unknown, you're headed out into this alien landscape that's just completely hostile to you. And you know, if you didn't have a nice ship and extremely warm clothes, you probably wouldn't be able to survive. And so Mosaic as a whole, it's a year-long drifting expedition. So it involves people from 20 different nations, about 600 scientists. It's a huge, massive effort meant to study the Arctic as a system, not just the ice, but things like the atmosphere, the ocean, biogeochemistry, all kinds of things in a way that allows us to look at what is happening throughout the course of the year. So we left Tromso on September 20th, it took us 10 days or so between leaving port, sailing out, picking up some instrumentation, uh, and then starting to sail into the ice pack uh, and starting to search for the flow. It was really difficult to find the flow uh, because we needed ice that was thick enough to support all our equipment. Some, some of it's very heavy and to do this safely. And actually one of the big surprises to me and a lot of people on board was just how thin the ice was. You'd get out on the ice, but it's dangerous. It's an alien landscape. It's cold, there's bears. The polar bear situation was really interesting. Uh, yeah, and, and kind of terrifying. <laughs> when we were out on the ice and we were setting things up, taking measurements, the bears did come back two times when I was there. And there, there, they came to our camp and they were doing things like messing with the equipment and, and going through our site. So there it was different because they're, they're, they're more on the turf that we had set up. You know, this is our turf now and now they're, they're coming in and I could see them in places that I had been. So we were very isolated on the, the polar stern and we had very limited connectivity. We had a, an email account we could send 50 kilobytes a message. It was a big change for me and a lot of people. A lot of people said, you know, after a week or so, I didn't miss it anymore. And I was one of those people. I really appreciated being a bit more isolated for a while and experiencing life in a different way. Doing field work like this brought me right there to the ice. When I do my research, I use data like this from the, the data that's taken up close on the ice. Sometimes that's the only way to get information on the ice. Things like how dense is the ice or how dense is the snow, you can't do this remotely. But we can use this to do calibration and validation of ice at two over the course of the year. So this is valuable for improving the, the retrieval techniques that we use for ice at two. For me to be on the ground and get that different look at the, the ice and the surface, it just helps me as a scientist come up with new ideas and to inspire me to use the data that I have and then think about this in a, a totally new way, in a different way.
This is no ordinary aircraft, and on board is no ordinary spacecraft. This C5 Super Galaxy is hauling something special. It can carry what no other airplane can carry in the Air Force. Width, length, weight, you name it, it can get on that thing. This jet can do it like no other jet. After two years of construction at Lockheed Martin in Denver and a few hours in the air, Noah's Goes S has finally made it to Kennedy Space Center, where the countdown to T0 begins. It's always exciting to bring a satellite down to the, down to Kennedy Space Center and participate in that whole activity of getting a satellite ready for launch. Getting it out here, rolling it into the launch processing facility, that was a very big deal for us. It's one of the hugest milestones in any spacecraft program is ship. It's not easy to transport something like this across the country. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, this is where all these people that have worked on this program for a couple of years, it culminates into the excitement of getting ready for uh, what we call launch fever. And so now, you know, we get to kind of do some of the fun stuff, like put it on a giant airplane and take it to Kennedy Space Center, where uh, we get to prepare it to go onto a, an Atlas V launch vehicle and Launch. It's the job of NASA's Launch Services Program to get GOES-S into orbit, and they have just a few months to do the final launch preps and inspections before T-0 arrives. This is no easy task with a spacecraft of this size and complexity. In spaceflight, there are no second chances. A successful launch is resting on their shoulders. It has to be perfect the first time. It's very exciting. I love being a part of this, and I love being able to contribute to the spacecraft and to its success. GOES-S is the second part of a weather satellite upgrade project NOAA is undertaking, destined to save lives by modernizing our weather forecasting ability. We have a very young team, and this is some of them, this will be their first campaign. So we're trying to put the excitement into that, let them feel what it's like to touch the spacecraft for the last time. Launch operations is time we all get together for one goal, and which is launch. But achieving that goal will not be easy. The road to T-0 has just begun. There's only one cargo ship designed to transport rockets for United Launch Alliance. And tonight, it's pulling into Port Canaveral with a robust... ...will begin momentarily. Please stand by. Your conference will begin momentarily. And as a reminder, this recall is being recorded. <laughs>
afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Joshua Finch of NASA's Office of Communications. We're here to discuss NASA's SpaceX Crew-1 mission, including results from testing of the Falcon 9 Merlin engines following unexpected data SpaceX noted during recent non-NASA launching. Today, I'm joined by Kathy Leaders, Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations Mission Director at NASA headquarters in Washington, Steve Stitch, Manager, Commercial Crew Program at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, and Hans Koenigsman, Vice President of Build and Fight Reliability at SpaceX and Hawthorne. We'll begin with opening comments from our speakers and then open it up for questions. To get into the queue, you can press star one on your phone. And then about an hour after this call, we can, as we conclude this, you can listen to a replay by dialing 888-566-0041. And for now, I'll go to Kathy for some opening comments. Kathy? Uh, thank you, Josh. Well, a real exciting time frame again. I'm a little uh, jealous of Steve because he gets to uh, be getting ready as commercial crew program manager now, but um, sitting in, in this seat, I'm able to look at really the phenomenal uh, progress he's been making and that the teams are making as we're moving toward our first full increment uh, launch and crew capability for the International Space Station. You know, we'll once again have a full complement of US OS crew members on board. And, and obviously we'll also have once again our JAXA crew member. Really exciting time frame for the agency, really exciting time frame for our partners. And uh, I know that the science community is looking forward to having all those arms and legs on orbit to be able to help them accomplish their goals for this increment. Thank you, Josh. And with that, we'll go to Steve Stitch. Steve. Hey, good afternoon and thank you, Josh. Uh, as Kathy said, it's really exciting to be here as we start to prepare, uh, have the final preparations for our first uh, increment mission. Uh, we've been working hand-in-hand uh, -hand with SpaceX, a tremendous partnership uh, to work through this engine anomaly. Uh, Hans will tell you more details, but we're going to swap out two. We're in the process of swapping out two engines on the first stage of the Crew-1 vehicle uh, due to this problem, and that, that is in work at this time. And, and we're working toward a, a launch date of Saturday, November 14th. The launch time is uh, 7.49 Eastern time. Uh, we'll have a unique docking opportunity for that day. Uh, we'll be docking about eight and a half hours after launch. Uh, that's about uh, 4.04 a.m. Eastern time. And then, of course, we have a backup opportunity Sunday, November 15th at 7.27 uh, Eastern time as well. Uh, between now and when we get into the final preps for launch, uh, we have a, a few critical reviews uh, coming up. Uh, uh, tomorrow we have a review with SpaceX, what we call their flight readiness review, and we'll do that um, side by side with SpaceX. Friday we'll have our commercial crew program, FRR, um, and then uh, leading to the agency FRR uh, with Kathy and uh, the leadership of the agency on uh, Monday the 9th. And at that point we'll get into our standard process for, uh, for counting down for the flight. Uh, we'll have our static fire that Monday. We'll do a practice with the crew uh, on the 11th. Uh, November 11th, and then heading toward launch on the 14th. Uh, the crew's doing well. We uh, did, as we started to work through the, uh, the anomaly and start to see a path to get to flight on the 14th, we did put the crew in a, a soft quarantine over the weekend, this past weekend, and uh, they've been uh, in a lot of the telecons and listening to what's going on with the vehicles. Uh, we have a little bit more work to do uh, on this uh, engine anomaly, which Hans will talk about. Uh, but I think we see a pretty good path to get the flight, and we'll uh, we'll fly when we're ready. We've certainly taken the time, and the SpaceX team is committed to flying when we're ready as well. So thank you, Josh. Thank you, Steve. And now we'll go over to Hans. Yeah, thanks, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, like uh, Kathy and Steve already mentioned, uh, it's getting exciting, and uh, there's lots of activity here, both on the uh, the Hawthorn side and, of course, also on the Cape side, getting uh, Dragon and. Uh, and the Falcon 9 vehicle ready for the uh, for the pr pretty quickly upcoming uh, crew run launch. Um, we did have an issue earlier this month. We uh, stood down from a Falcon 9 launch attempt with the uh, GPS 3-4 spacecraft. 
Um, we had an auto abort uh, during the engine ignition, basically in the last, uh, I think it was like three seconds or something like that. Um, and it was caused by uh, an early start behavior on two of the engines. Uh, in this case, it was engine one and engine two. And it was a, it was a good abort. Um, it uh, did exactly what we programmed it to do. Um, when we uh, we looked at the data, we saw that uh, that two of the engines uh, attempted to start early, and uh, and the um, auto abort uh, prevented that. And um, but by by doing that, it prevented a possible um, hard start that could have been damaging to the engine hardware. Um, the team went right into inspecting the engines on the pad. It didn't see anything. Uh, everything was configured right. Uh, tubing was correct. Uh, nothing really obvious. And so we, um, we pulled the engines, or we removed them rather, and uh, sent them to the test facility in McGregor in Texas for additional testing. And, and you know, this is one of those rare cases where we were actually able to replicate it in Texas, and uh, it was great for, for troubleshooting. Uh, it did the same thing on the test stand. We performed additional inspections then on the engine, and um, we found a uh, a relief valve, um, like a little little line that goes to the relief uh, valve blocked in the in the gas generator. The gas generator is uh, it's basically like a little rocket engine that powers the uh, turbine tur wheel that then powers the pump, um, which feeds the propellant into the main chamber. And it's it's obviously a very important part, and um, that little uh, red substance uh, was blocking a relief valve that uh, caused it to um, function a little bit earlier than it was supposed to do. Uh, we found that the substance was a masking lacquer um, left over, basically. Uh, it appeared to be a leftover from the build process, um, where we mask certain parts uh, doing a surface treatment. And probably during the washing or the cleaning process, um, some of that uh, masking lacquer um, went into this vent hole and uh, blocked it. And uh, we could actually show that when, you, when we remove that uh, that masking lacquer from the from the vent hole, that the engine performed perfectly normal and and uh, you know started up um, at the right timing um, as it's supposed to do. So it was a really great find in that sense, uh, and allowed us to uh, to to fix something that is very subtle, but can can have obviously some negative impact on the engine operation. Um, we then went and looked at the uh, all the engine startup signatures across the fleet, and we found similar similar curves or similar early tendencies on um, the crew run booster. Uh, on two engines, um, like I said earlier, we had two on, on GPS already, and um, and then we found another one on Sentinel, um, which is the uh, our upcoming NASA launch from uh, from no, Vandenberg. For yeah, so um, and as we go into uh, you know going going forward, then we um, especially on crew we. Uh, we removed those engines and uh, and replaced them with um, engines that have gas generators that have uh, you know clean 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 vent holes and and uh, tested as well and um, and that's the fastest way currently to uh, towards launch. We also make uh, we continue to make progress on the uh, Dragon Dragon spacecraft. The team is uh, basically uh, processing ahead of the, the November 14 launch attempt. Um, and everything is going well there. Um, over the last couple of weeks, when we troubleshot this and uh, and worked with the team through the uh, through the uh, data and uh, the test results, uh, you know, the, both the, the Space Force and NASA stood by our side and uh, and worked with us. Uh, was as as always a um, op operation under partners and uh, led to a. Uh, really good um, review and really good uh, anomaly resolution that in, uh, in, my, in my opinion makes us a better vehicle, a better, better engine going forward. Um, thanks. Thank you, Han. And we'll now go into the media Q&A portion. 
Uh, to ensure as many people get uh, questions as possible, please ask only one question per person, and then please do state your name and affiliation to whom you're directing your question uh, during this time. And our first question will come from Stephen Clark. Stephen? Thanks, Josh. Stephen Clark from Spaceflight Now. Just to clarify, Hans, uh, uh, what was the material you found in this relief valve uh, line? Uh, didn't quite catch uh, what that was, and can you describe um, you know, is, is it a solid material? Uh, what is it like? And also, the engines that you found this uh, uh, early start signature are they all from the same build lot? Are they all were they all manufactured in the same group? And these other engines that don't exhibit this behavior are they from a different lot? Thanks. Yeah. So um, it was described to me as a lacquer. Basically, if you think nail polish, I think that's a good analogy. Um, and in this case, it had a, a red color, like a nail polish, I guess. And um, and when you when you clean this out, it gets a little bit um, thinner, and then uh, you know, imagine it creeps into a hole basically and and hardens out there. That's uh, that's a good good mental image of um, what we saw um, inside the gas generator. Um, regarding your question um, for like build, um, we build engines uh, consistently, and they're they're all from the same. Uh, I guess version is maybe the wrong wrong term here. They've been built subsequently and 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 are all the same. It's uh, I want to say uh, whether they have this uh, this little defect or not depends on on uh, um, uh, seems to be seems to be random basically. There's a few engines that have that, and the other engines uh, we inspected are all clean. Our next question will come from Gina Sinceri at ABC News. Uh, this is Gina. Um, Kathy, can you walk me through the leak uh, that was uh, on the space station, how it was discovered and how it was repaired? Uh, sure, a um, little bit outside of this context, but but um, you know we we've, we've been doing several uh, isolation exercises across the station and ended up um, uh, noticing uh, as we were you know you can isolate different parts of the module but it's a part and and so we were able to those exercises to be able to isolate it to the ARK and and um, and then you know the astronauts are very very resourceful and when you're on orbit it's a little bit harder to go figure out you know just movements can create uh, movements of of you know the the different particles and fluids and so so they had to they kind of opened up some tea bags and did some different things to and then close the hatch and to see if there was places within the module that they were able to, that the particles um, and, and the small particles, you know, um, collected. And then they were able to go in with a, a finer detector and verified that and then saw this. And it's a very, we tend to look at big blown up pictures, but it's really a very uh, light, Scratch. It looked like a scratch in, in the side of the module, and and so that was really the key indication. And then to verify that that was the potential leak source, we um, created kind of a temporary, you know, bagging patch over it, um, and and then continued to monitor the overall, um, you know, nitrogen uh, availability in the module, and then we're able to show that the leakage rate went down considerably. So we right now, you know, there's a, a sturdier patch over it and uh, we're looking at options for a long-term repair. Our next question will come from Bill Harwood at CBS News. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a question for Hans. Um, and I apologize, I may have misunderstood the words you were using when you were describing some of this, but you described it as an early start, I thought, and you said st a software stopped it. If it hadn't, you said it could have led to some damage. I didn't understand that sequence. I mean, 
would the rocket have taken off? Uh, would the engines have shut down after ignition? You know, would anything have blown up or otherwise done something bad? I just don't really understand that sequence in the last couple of seconds. Thanks. Yeah, it's fair. It's uh, it's actually pretty uh, it's pretty complicated in the last seconds. Uh, not you know a lot happens in that in that last well, couple of seconds. Um, and I, I I spoke a little bit first earlier too. So I'm, let me uh, let me try to explain it. Basically, when you start an engine or you know in, in this case a rocket engine, I mean. Um, and the, the, the gas generator is very similar to the main chamber there too. Um, you need to, we have a liquid that, that's called T-tap that, that starts, starts the whole process. It gives us a, uh, it has like this green flame that you sometimes see. And then we have liquid oxygen and we have, um, we have kerosene or RP1 as it's called. And you, you need to introduce these, these liquids in the right order. If you, if you do this in the wrong order, if you, if you happen to uh, throw in the liquid oxygen and the RP1 and then the, the, the igniter fluid, then, then what, what could happen is a hard, we call it a hard start. Yeah? It's not necessarily bad. It, uh, in, in most cases, you know, it, it rattles the engine and it may cause, you know, a little bit of damage on the engine. In extreme cases, it may cause more damage to the engine. So in, in general, you do not want that. You want a, a, a good startup. And so we have basically a, uh, an abort where a sensor measures the, the pressure um, in the chamber. And if you see the pressure rise too early, then we know there must be uh, the liquid is in there and it shouldn't be in there. And that's when the software on the engine controller then actually stops the whole process and 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 basically tells tells everything on the vehicle to to uh, uh, to stop and uh, and not continue and the whole time it's it's safe because it's held down on the ground yeah it's uh, there's a system it's a hydraulic system that holds the vehicle down and only when all nine engines are running and uh, at the right pressure and we we, we watch this for um, I think it's a it's a it's a fraction of a second, but for an engine that's a long time, nevertheless. Yeah, and for a computer, obviously, and so we we know that the engines are running and uh, running well by the time we usually let them we usually let the vehicle um, go. But in this case, um, like I said, it was held down. We shut everything down safely and then uh, go into an engine uh, a, a launch scrap basically. Our yep. next question will come from Marsha Dunn at the Associated Press. Yes, hi. Uh, one question for Hans and one maybe for Kathy. Um, Hans, um, when, when this cleaning work was being done with the lacquer, how, how was you know, bright red um, residue missed during inspections um, during, oh. during this process? And, and, for, and for Kathy, will you insist on the Sentinel launching from Vandenberg? before the crew launch and what happens if it gets delayed out in California. Thanks. Yeah, hi, Marsha. Um, on the, um, how was this missed? Um, the, the, the little borehole that goes to the vent valve is tiny. It's, uh, it's 60 thousandths of an inch. I think that's one and a half millimeter. 60,000 at least the, the right number. And so when, when something goes in there and, and hardens in there, it's, it, it's possible you, you miss it. Shouldn't, shouldn't, you know, with a lot of light, obviously, but, but um, I can see how, how, how people um, overlook that and, uh, and didn't, didn't quite see that, even if it is red. And uh, Marsha, you know, we're still working through uh, our final work on Sentinel, and um, you know, after we understand after the program, the, the launch services program, who's managing that flight, goes and looks at the data on their mission. Um, we'll go figure out when's the right time to go fly that. Uh, there right now is not a hard bar between these missions, right? We're going to fly both missions when it's the right time, and when we feel like it's the best time to fly those missions. But um, there's no linkage between the two nations. And, and, and that's adding to my earlier, the, the little borehole is also half an inch and longer, so it's hard, harder to see there too. Okay, 
I'm sorry, Hans. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that's just answering me. your question. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. No, no, I, I, I thought I was done, Kathy. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> and our next question will come from Irene Klotz, Aviation Week. Thanks. My question also is for Hans. Were the uh, five Merlin engines that you described the only ones in the entire fleet that were found to have this problem? How many total were inspected? And um, have you changed anything in the manufacturing inspection or testing procedures to prevent this from reoccurring? Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, yes, it's a good, good question. Um, uh, let's see. Oh. So we, we, we certainly inspected the MVAC engines. Now that's super important there. Obviously it's the single engine on the second stage. Um, and so those are, those are really important. So all the, um, the missions that we, um, the upcoming missions plus the, I want to say either the last or the two last um, were inspected and, um, and cleared before we fly, uh, before we flew them, yeah? before we fly them in future. Um, on the on the Embraer D, we inspected all engines on GPS and on Crew One. I don't think we are done with Sentinel at this point in time, and we looked at the signatures on the boosters that we've flown several times, and did not inspect those. And um, so so what we've noticed is that this is something that must must have um, happened. I want to say within the last couple of months, um, so it affects primarily engine uh, build dates that are um, on new boosters and not on old boosters. I'm going out a little bit on a limb here because we haven't really checked that and we found that sometimes um, we have still residual in there and they start perfectly normal. Um, but we felt a lot more confident on the boosters that we've flown. You know, we had a, the last flight was a booster that flown three times, and there before that we had a booster that had flown, I want to say six times. Um, so many boosters, I, I might mix things up here. Um, but in either case, on the on the uh, on the older boosters, we were a lot more confident. On the newer um, engines, we we all inspect them now. And I want to say this is work in progress too. It's uh, it's important that we check all the engines and make sure that there's nothing in there. And uh, in, in that sense, it's actually an improvement um, on our build process uh, and and makes us a, a safer engine. Thanks. So, did you make any modifications in build, test, or inspection? No, no, no. We we we. Um, it's a good point. So we, we um, certainly the inspection when we get the material, um, we inspect them right away. Not not um, that that's one change we made. Um, we're working with a vendor. It, what we what corrective actions we should do to avoid that completely. But um, you know, in, in the short term, we inspect every hardware that we have here for that. Also, this something like that triggers you know um, other thoughts. We. We have um, tons of valves that we build. We have tons of regulators, and they have like little vent paths inside the hardware. So we're now looking at all of this and making sure that there's no no uh, no leftovers. That all the boreholes are are clean and 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 good. We did a lot of that already in in testing, but this triggered uh, another effort to to really look at you know. Um, every passage and make sure that things are things are clear when I mean, you build them together. It's not great to find them later on the vehicle. It's it's much better to find them during a, a component test um, or actually during build actually, and and avoid them completely. That that's um, certainly preferred if it has to happen. Thank you. Our next question will come from Michael Sheets from CNBC. These questions will be for Hans. Um, perhaps Kathy can add maybe a little more color. Uh, in terms of the processing of the Crew-1 vehicle, I'm assuming that's ready to go in Florida. And uh, in a connection to that, I'm assuming this also means the uh, data review from the Demo-2 mission is complete. Is that right? 
Uh, that's correct. Um, so on the we are processing the uh, the two vehicles, Falcon and and uh, Dragon. I think you were mostly asking about Dragon. Um, we have a big review that uh, uh, Steve um, talked earlier about um, coming up tomorrow, I think. And um, and then after that review, we do propellant loading and uh, and go into really final integration. So we have some big milestones coming up, but um, everything there is uh, is going according to the uh, the schedule and the plan. Hey, Steve, why don't you talk about your review? Because you guys have been doing pretty extensive reviews of the demo two data. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that, Kathy. Yeah, we have side-by-side uh, -side with SpaceX reviewed all the data uh, from the demo two mission. Um, all the the funnies and we've dispositioned all those including you know we talked before about uh, the heat shield erosion around the tension tie we've dispositioned that um, the, the clogged area in the vents up in the nose cone that led to the early drogue deploy we've dispositioned that so we've gone through all the the demo 2 data uh, we've also been reviewing all the data on uh, both dragon and falcon uh, anything that uh, all the testing going through the flows um, and uh, that's heading, you know, we'll talk about any any things that are unusual at our flight readiness review coming up on Friday, um, and then heading into your uh, agency FRR on the 9th. Um, you know, the big milestone, as Han said, the next big milestone on Dragon really is um, propellant load for Dragon, and that would occur uh, over the weekend following uh, our FRR this, this Friday. We'd start, uh, start loading propellants on Dragon if things are still on track. Our next question will come from Eric Berger, Ars Technica. Hey, um, thanks for doing this. I guess my question is for Hans. You know, it, you've had this gas generator for quite a while. There's been hundreds of, of new engine starts in the Falcon 9 program. Um, why do you think this problem um, with, the, with the masking agent or had it occurred now? Obviously, you've flown a lot of engines. Have you just not detected it? Was there some new um, sensor or something this time, or, or, or what happened, do you think? Yeah, hi, Eric. Um, good question. Um, I I want to say there's this different part. There's certainly the possibility that we had um, cases of that earlier, and, and they were basically so harmless that we completely missed them as possible. Um, it's also possible that, uh, you know, uh, little things changed. Um, this is a process that's done out of house um, and in a, at a special, um, you know, vendor. And, uh, and so it could be that person is no more generous with cleaning fluid or anything. I'm, I'm really guessing here. It's a little bit hard to figure this out. We've been there, actually. We talked to the people. Um, we made them aware of that, and I'm pretty sure it will not happen anymore um, from that perspective. But um, in in hindsight, um, it's it's probably it's, it's difficult to explain um, how how this works for so many years, and then suddenly uh, um, you see this coming up um, in in the data. So um, the important part, I think, for for us is that we record it. Um, before anything happened, we we also had the right aboard Im, um, implemented. Right, that's that's really uh, actually uh, that's that's the other thing that I think is really great. We um, we expect the engine to go through a certain profile in in terms of measure the uh, pressure, and when it doesn't do that, then then uh, it stops, and 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 then we look at what that is. And in this case, this worked beautifully. It stopped and then gave the chance to uh, look at the engine and to figure out that if there's something wrong. So. Um, yeah, interesting how this happened in the end, but um, you know, really um, important for us that we fix it, um, tell tell the vendor that uh, you know, what happened there, and and make sure that it never happens again. And our next question is from Jeff Bow, the Space News. For uh, Steve Stitch, you mentioned the uh, eight and a half hour time from launch to docking if you launch on the 14th. Is that a, sort of an absolute minimum based on a perfect orbital alignment? And uh, what happens if, what's the transit time if you launch on the 15th instead? Thanks. 
Yeah, those are good good questions. Yeah, the way it works out right now in our sequence, it just turns out the 14th is that that eight and a half hour rendezvous, which is about as um, short a time as we can accommodate from uh, launch to do the maneuvers we need to, and then to get into the approach ellipsoid and start the rendezvous profile. Uh, the, the next day, if we go to uh, to Sunday, the 15th uh, Eastern time, it's it's back to the normal. It's like a 27 and a half hour rendezvous. The following days, it's back to it like a 28 hour rendezvous. So we get back into those normal, um, what we would call them flight day two or a couple days for the crew. So it just works out that the orbital mechanics is that way. And then it kind of repeats. Um, the next day would be a, 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 what we call flight day four, which would be one we wouldn't take. And then it would repeat again with that uh, early eight and a half hour rendezvous. Our next question is from Samantha Mahanaga at the LA Times. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this earlier, but what exactly is the purpose of the masking agent? Um, you know, what what is it there to do? And this question is for Han. Sorry. Yeah, good good question. Uh, this is um, so when you this is a, for a surface treatment when you. Um, I think it's called anodizing in this case. I always mix them up, aldehyde and anodized, but it's anodized. So um, it's basically a, a, a surface treatment of, of um, in this case, alum, aluminum parts, uh, your corrosion, put, corrosion protection, and uh, stuff like that. And and certain areas you do not want to um, to cover with um, the anodized, and so that's why you use the masking um, part to, like threads, for example, yeah. And, and you protect them basically with that. And at the end of it, uh, you need to remove it again and and uh, and clean it up again. And I would add, Hans, that's a pretty standard process that's yeah, yeah. Used for anodizing to protect certain areas that you don't really want to anodize. Exactly, want. Yeah. So it's very standard uh, in aerospace to use that masking agent. Our next question will come from Joe Roulette at Reuters. Yeah, question for Hans. Um, what components were the uh, was the vendor responsible for? Like, what was their role in this? And um, what changes are you guys and, and the vendor making to the inspection process? And for for Steve, does NASA have any corrective actions or recommendations for SpaceX after finding this blacker? Thanks. Yeah. So. Um, the vendor performs the process of um, anodizing for us. So we, we deliver a part, the vendor performs that, that process, and then we get the, the, the anodized part back to, to um, SpaceX again, and then we start building it up um, with the other components. Um, the, there's things we can do on our side, you know, we can, uh, it can can make parts inspectable so that you see them like at a straight uh, line of sight, basically. Um, certainly, and then in general, we can just um, on on incoming inspections, we can we can list um, specifically look into this borehole and make sure it's clear and does not show any any uh, red or otherwise colored um, residual. So I think I think the the fixes are relatively easy. Um, both on the design side as well as on the uh, on the process side, um, yeah, and and it's it's just um, just double double making sure that uh, you know everything is clean by the time you you put it together. In, in terms of corrective actions from NASA, I mean SpaceX moved out very quickly when they found the problem to immediately inspect the engines in the fleet, including our engines on Crew One. And as Hans said, they work with the vendor to improve the process. They're going to work to uh, improve their receiving inspection. And, and then we, we ask them as well, hey, go look across the F9 and Dragon. Are there any other places where you might use a similar masking that would have a maybe a small orifice? When Hans talks about 60 thousandths, it's a sixteenth of an inch. So if you're on your ruler, it's that very first mark on your ruler. Uh, in terms of the diameter of the bore, um, and so they're they're off looking at that, and making sure there's no other areas that we might have this uh, on Falcon 9 or uh, on Dragon. So, um, and SpaceX shares all those corrective actions with us, and we work uh, side by side with them 
uh, part of the correct inspection process. Was anything on this Crew Dragon uh, inspected in light of this? Um, they are in the process of uh, looking at certain areas where uh, you might use a similar process. So, so far today, we haven't found anything that needed an inspection on this Crew Dragon. Our next question will come from Mike Wall at space.com. Um, this is probably for Steve. Could you just tell us a little bit like, about what the astronauts are up to and will be for the next two and a half weeks? I think you mentioned soft quarantine that they recently went in. Can you just tell, tell us a little bit about how they're going to be spending this, this time coming up to the planned launch? Thanks. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, over the weekend, uh, actually this past Sunday, they went into to soft quarantine, which just means they take a little extra precautions. They're 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 still at home with their families. Uh, they are uh, in the process right now of uh, doing a little additional uh, and final training, any touch-up training they need to do, simulations and practice uh, on the different aspects of flight, including rendezvous docking and and uh, ascent and entry. Uh, then they would go into uh, a little more stringent quarantine uh, on uh, Halloween, actually the Saturday. They would go into a, a more stringent quarantine. Um, and again, continue to get ready for the flight. They'll go down, medical checks go down to the, they travel down to KSC uh, on Friday the 6th. Um, and then while they're there, they'll participate in a, a number of events, uh, getting in their suits and making sure their suits are ready for flight. Um, they'll watch the static fire of the rocket, which is a uh, firing of all nine engines on the first stage, which should be on Monday the 9th. And then we'll, we'll do a practice with the crew. Um, we call it a dry dress. It's basically an end-to-end -end, uh, rehearsal or simulation of taking the crew, um, getting them out of crew quarters, uh, getting them to the suit room, getting them suited up. The SpaceX team will then transport them out to the launch pad and put them in drag, and, and we'll uh, practice that whole uh, timeline, and that'll be on Wednesday the 11th. So that's a big dress rehearsal. Uh, you know, we had two crew, Doug um, and Bob, on the last flight. Now we have four crew and an international astronaut, so we'll go practice that whole getting in the vehicle and getting suited up and strapped in. Um, so that's kind of a little thumbnail sketch of what the crew's doing. Thanks. And our next question is from Tim Farholtz at Quartz. Hi there, thank you for taking the question. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, what the implications of this are for refurbishing uh, used SpaceX engines. Uh, it seems like, obviously this is an issue with new ones, but it, it does seem like it is a lot of work to go in and inspect uh, this area since you've only chosen to do that on certain engines. Uh, so I, I just wonder uh, if you can give us a, an idea of, of what this might uh, lead you to do when you're using previously used engines, if you've taken any learnings from that. Yeah, hi, Tim. Um, it's, uh, so so we, I don't think it's that hard to inspect. Um, we, we found ways. I mean, it's certainly uh, easier on, on MVAC, basically, but on the, on, on the M&Ds, we need to, um, um, to remove a little bit on the heat shield or on, on the side uh, barrel basically, and then uh, we can we can inspect it from there. But it, it is work at, at the end of the day, and we we prioritized um, you know crew crew and GPS over um, any other vehicles um, because they're, they're so so important. And then Sentinel, of course, uh, is, is in that in that class too. Um, like I said earlier on the on the flown boosters, we uh, we certainly looked at all the family data on the startup and um, and. We uh, we haven't had reasons to go in there so far. Um, we might uh, we might you know once we do refurbishment we might do it at the same time and just verify that. That's uh, that seems to me the the, the best path forward. But uh, to be fair, we so far we only uh, focus on these three boosters and uh, three upper stages as being the most uh, the most relevant right now. It's, a, it's an advantage when you fly the booster and it worked fine, you know, then, then you know at least uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's flight proven, which is exactly always our point. Our next question is from David Curley with the Discovery Channel. Hey questions. Uh, Hans, this is for you. Um, 
has the vendor been uh, working with you for a long time? Have you figured out whether they changed their processes? And bigger picture, what does it say that a hole that is one sixteenth of an inch um, could jeopardize a mission? So, yeah, I mean, um, as far as I know, we, this is not the, the only vendor where we've seen that. We have, we have multiple vendors, so um, it's not a specific vendor, and it's not, it's not um, this, is, this is all not about pointing fingers or, or, or so, but, but just to make us, um, make us and the, our vendor base, of course, better in general. Um, I, I, I think it's a small hole and it can have some impact, but I do want to remind you, we did have the abort in, in place and it actually, um, you know, protected us from that. So I feel like we, uh, we have a, a pretty safe system here in, in place. And then it's also, this has the potential for, for damage, but it doesn't necessarily have damage right away. I mean, this is a, a pretty subtle, um, fair mode and 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 you know you can protect against the fallout like we did with an abort i think that's uh um that's that's a that's a pretty pretty safe operation that we had and we make it safer with the the improvements we we're going to introduce have you ever thought that a surface preparation of lacquer could cause a rocket engine to shut down Oh, you know, there's so many things that can do that. <laughs> uh, to be fair, over over my life at SpaceX, I've seen so little little things having big effects. Um, no, no, no question. This um, rocketry is tough and uh, and requires a lot of attention to detail. This is uh, this is this to me. This almost tells me that rockets are humbling me every time I, I every day I work with them. It's uh, it's always a challenge and it's always difficult, and you have to be super diligent and, and on your toes to, to get this right. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lauren Rush, The Verge. Thank you so much. Uh, this question is for Hans. I was wondering, can you confirm if you actually um, found the lacquer in these two engines, or did you just notice it based on the, the, the early tendency curve that you were talking about earlier? And also, can you tell us about the swapping process for the engines? How long does that take, and what kind of testing is required once you do swap out those engines? Yeah, we did. We did. So we did see it originally on the data. Um, we then, you know, we we um, we CT scanned one of the uh, uh, gas generators, and then and we found it in the in the CT scan. We saw something in there. Uh, it's not super clear because it's not metallic. Um, and then we open it up and actually verify that it is lacquer in those and those two engines. And so far, we we've been able to um, find the lacquer in in engines that showed the behavior. Um, uh, in order to swap an engine, it depends a little bit on where you are. Um, if you are still in the factory, it's relatively straightforward. If you're in Texas at our test site. Um, also relatively straightforward, maybe uh, two or three days. Um, and if you're on the launch side, you can also do it that quickly, but you do not, you, you have to go um, a little bit more in serial because you have to rotate the rocket. So you, 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 um, you have to be out of the transport director basically, yeah, and, and on the shop floor. Um, and then, and then you have, um, you know, a few d d days for, for a team. By now, the team is pretty experienced to do this, and and if we see issues with the the engine, it's almost easier to just take the engine out and 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 look at it in in the test stand rather than trying to to troubleshoot this on the rocket. Um, it's the safer way to do this. So we've been pretty uh, pretty good in in engine swappery um, over the last year and and, and longer and. Uh, yeah, like I said, two or three days is, is uh, roughly what you need to take it out, and then another two or three days to put it back in again. Our next question is from Leo Enright with Irish Television. I see, obviously, well, obviously, this uh, launch is uh, an evening launch, uh, two hours actually after sunset. Um, so I, I'm wondering just how uh, comfortable you are with. Uh, launching at night on your first operational flight, uh, thinking particularly uh, about uh, potential search and rescue scenarios. Uh, and I'm particularly interested 
uh, in the unlikely scenario of a transatlantic abort into the Shannon recovery zone uh, off the coast of Ireland, because, of course, it will be the middle of the night here in Ireland. Uh, and I wondered if any of this factored into your thinking. What was that question for? Uh, I, uh, I guess Kathy. I, I, I can try to take that question. Why don't you this start? Why don't you start? Because, I mean, this is, I will just tell you, this is what we plan for, right? Um, and it's, that's kind of part of our, our strategy. But, um, Steve, you, you talk about all the things you guys have done to get ready for this scenario. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say we uh, have planned for these scenarios. We uh, have Detachment 3 rescue forces in place to go do a rescue. Um, the main thing that we do to try to avoid uh, abo abort and ended up in this scenario is to try to make sure that the vehicle is, is as safe as it can be. And the things that we've done in this case are we've inspected the, the engines uh, on the first stage, and we know they're good. We've inspected the engine, the MVAC engine, that upper stage engine that Hans talked about. Um, but the search and rescue forces, getting back to that that end of the equation, they are ready to go do their mission, whether it be day or night. Uh, and we've known for a long time, uh, as we prepared for these uh, fl increment flights, that we would have to fly in certain times of the year uh, when we would have a dark launch. and. And so we're uh, we're ready to go do that. And the search and rescue teams practice that. Um, they practice uh, getting up to the capsule in the dark and extracting the crew in the dark and all those sorts of things. So um, so we're ready to go do that. And we have weather uh, criteria in place uh, when the weather is unacceptable um, in certain locations uh, for the, uh, the the abort weather along the ground track. Then we wouldn't launch. And, and then over the last 100 launches, I found that often night weather is better than day weather, at least on the launch side. So there's, there's trades. Definitely Florida afternoons aren't great. <laughs> <laughs> In the summertime, definitely. Uh, and our final question for today will come from Dave Mosier, a business insider. Um, thank you for doing this. Um, Hans, I have one for you, and, and Kathy or Steve, another for you. Um, Hans, you said rockets humble you every day. Uh, they certainly humble reporters here. Um, given that this issue got to the pad, though, is SpaceX approaching its vendors and processes um, any differently, in, like in a broad sense, to maybe look for some other unknowns? Um, and then for Kathy or Steve, I, I just wanted to clarify that you're wanting to see data from both GPS-3 and Sentinel-6. It's one of those missions before you're comfortable flying Crew-1. Thanks. Yeah, you, 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 got a, you got a good point there. I mean, um, things like that, you know, um, even they, they didn't, this didn't cause damage. Um, this was all, you know, contained and, and safe. But it, it acts a little bit as a as a call um, to us too, and then you know you you double your effort. I want to say we we always you know prior to every launch we scrub everything. We go through this. Um, we're fully aware of the, the the dire consequences of of a mistake here, and we've been doing this for many years now. So um, yeah, it's it, it certainly I, I I use it actually a little bit as a as a. You know, double your efforts, triple it, and and look at it again. And uh, and even if you think you've done this last week, just verify you did that. Yeah. And and, and I think that's why I'm saying. You know, this, there's always an upside um, when you have something like that. That the team is energized. The team wants to be really good. The team wants to improve it. And and like I said, at the end of the day, you you improve your process. You improve your uh, vigilance, and you 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 have a better rocket on the launch pad for for the next couple launches. Absolutely. Hey, Steve, I'll let you talk about what you guys wanted to get out of the missions in between, if anything. Um, yeah. Like like I said before, definitely Sentinel-6 was, and where it is from an overall mission manifest perspective, there weren't any constraints. But um, maybe there was something, Steve, you, you guys are looking at the data on all the missions. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that, Kathy. I do want to add one comment to, you know, what, what the question was asked of Hans. I mean, I've been doing this for a, quite a long time, too, and uh, 
you know, little little things, uh, attention to detail, uh, we have all learned in space flight. You know, Han said it's humbling, and it is, and it takes it takes that kind of attention to detail. And, and so, I mean, I see this as a bit of a gift. We found it. The software correctly aborted the launch. Then we were able to inspect and find it and make it better. And so that's the process that SpaceX does and every time that we find something like this. And, and it's something that we continue to be vigilant on uh, for all the crew flights. Uh, in terms of uh, what we would like to see, there is uh, one of the engines that we are installing on the first stage um, ha has a slight change that we would like to see fly on the GPS-3 uh, mission first. So uh, we're trying to, we're talking to our team between us and SpaceX, and, and right now we would, we would like to see that one mission go fly before we fly crew. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. As a reminder, NASA and SpaceX are targeting 7.49 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Saturday, November 14th, for the launch of the first crew rotation mission to the International Space Station as a part of our commercial crew program. In about an hour, you can listen to a replay of this teleconference by dialing 888-566-0041. Thanks, everyone, and have a good evening. conference by dialing 888-566-0041.